Ease 5 is a special entry into the series for a lot of reasons, especially in the eyes of people who have not played the game, of which there are plenty. It was the last of the old titles, closing off the series on the Super Nintendo until the Ark of the Pishtim brought it back in the PlayStation 2 era eight years later. A lot of people often question just how bad was this game to kill off the E series for two consecutive console generations? Since Ease 5 was one of the last games in the series to get a fan translation, and as of now is still the only of the older Ease games to not receive a modern remake, not too many people have experienced the doll's adventures in Xandria, as it's still listed as missing on the modern timeline as an empty entry. As there's no modern remake, and the only other major release of Ease 5 is another Taito PlayStation 2 release, this video only covers Ease 5 Lost Kevin. Kingdom of Sand on the Super Nintendo. So let's get this review started. Ease 5 takes place after Adol's adventures in Falgana in Ease 3. Traveling alone, he reaches Xandria, a city located in Africa. His reputation precedes him as he's quickly put in contact with a rich merchant by the name of Dorman who wants him to hunt down legendary crystals. It's not long after this that Adol finds that there's an ancient legend in this land about a red-haired adventurer who will one day bring ruin to Africa. A few comic relief bandits try to trip Adol up on his adventure, also in search of the same crystals. They bring a strangely high amount of slapstick comedy with them to this game, and it feels a bit weird whenever they're on screen. In the meantime, there's talk about how the desert has been spreading rapidly, destroying towns in the process, and the crystals themselves appear to be linked to the disappearance of Kefen, an all-powerful kingdom of sand that one day simply vanished. For most of the game, the story feels like a throwaway plot of no real importance, which was a huge letdown after the previous four games, and is something that's reflected in a lot of the game's design and appearance too. I wouldn't say that Ease 5 is especially bad as a game, it's not the worst Ease game that I've covered so far, but I can see how people would just bounce off it if they picked it up blindly. It feels strange to say, but I think Falcom was trying to mimic their competition in a very direct manner. The gameplay in Adult Sprite reminds me very heavily of Brain Lord, a game that came out a year prior. This might just be me though, but I just couldn't stop shaking that feeling off the entire game. The rotational menu and the way it looks and moves reminds me a lot of Secret of Mana's menu systems. Except more confusing, because for some reason you actively switch the position of the menu elements after moving them, so the same directions don't move to the same elements every time as you're replacing them horizontally and vertically. It's incredibly confusing and I don't understand why it works this way. The cutscene direction very much feels like a very early Squaresoft Super Nintendo RPG. With that very specific way that NPCs move and the way the camera cuts the scenes with heavy pixelation effects. And the music... Well, it's not bad. Doesn't sound like anything by Falcom. It sounds like typical JRPG music from the Super Nintendo, and while that's not bad, it's certainly not as memorable as the music from other titles in the series. And they switch the songs on the maps so often that you often only hear the intro sequences to most songs, making the repetition just really stand out all the more. Mask of the Sun had a problem of giving great compositions lackluster renditions, but Lost Kevin has the opposite problem. The songs just sound bland and uninspired, while fitting the Super Nintendo sound chip a lot better. I think one of the biggest problems with the music is just that it's on a really slow tempo, not giving you that typical fast momentum that Ease tracks are generally known for. Though at least this is something that's also reflected in the gameplay. The combat in Ease 5 is traditional top-down action RPG combat. You walk up to enemies and swing your sword at them. You you have a button you can hold to hold your shield up as well. Either action locks you in place, even attacking while jumping locks you in your position when you do it. So the typical workaround most games give you for slow attacks doesn't work in Ease 5. A lot of enemies can also guard, and as you can probably guess, every element of combat slows the game down just that bit more. 
which includes the actual slowdown, of which there is surprisingly plenty. Ease 5 doesn't like it if there's a lot of sprites and effects on the screen, which there are during most boss fights. Even regular combat encounters with normal enemies that have ranged attacks can have a huge impact on the game's engine's capacity to run normally. There's also a weird problem that the game has dealing with slightly elevated terrain. Moving upwards on elevated terrain can be a pain a lot of the time. Like the game is stopping you from going up a pixel or two. At the same time, there's highly elevated platforms that the game has no problems with you accidentally dropping from it if you move even the slightest bit too close to it. This is something that becomes especially annoying during certain moments dealing with a jump puzzle near a waterfall, where near the end they start placing enemies firing projectiles at you on small platforms. Falling off the platforms ensures you have to redo the entire section. It's the only part of the game where I can see people struggle with it, not because it's hard, but because the platforming is so fickle and the combat is not all that accurate and being forced to repeat this section can just leave you incredibly frustrated. To add to this, the rotational menu is slow. And if you just want to use a healing potion, you have to use this menu to go to a traditional JRPG menu and then select it from there. A lot of extra steps for basic actions are pretty typical of this game. The most confusing extra step in Ease 5, to me at least, was that enemies drop gems when you kill them. You can sell these gems for money, there's nothing else you can do with them. And it's also the only way to get money in the game. Almost every shop in the game lets you trade your gems for money, so there's basically no reason for it to work this way. There shouldn't be a middle step between killing enemies and getting the income needed to buy items, but for some reason there is. Add to all of this that the hitboxes on enemies and your sword are incredibly fickle and a lot of attacks that feel like they should have hit typically don't. It's not a great combat system, and I'm not surprised that Falcom took a break after this to try and figure out how else to do it, because combat is a bit of a mess. That said, as much of a mess as the combat is, at least it's not unfair or even remotely hard. The game is incredibly easy. Ease 5 throws absurd amounts of EXP at you, and it doesn't take too long until you're overpowered compared to most enemies with no grinding required. To add to this, you can stock up to 10 potions, so you're pretty much never in danger of dying to anything all game long. Bosses are a cakewalk, and most of the time you can just out DPS them by just continuously attacking them. You might need to heal once per boss, but that's about it. Most of the time I ended up using a healing potion, it was usually two hits before I beat them. There is a rebalanced version of the game that came out later in Japan called Ease 5 Expert, and I haven't tried this version of the game myself, but from my understanding all they did was rebalance some numbers around. Ease 5's combat needs a lot more work done than that, and I think padding numbers is only going to make it more tedious and slow paced than it already is. Given that it's the game with the slowest pace in the series I've played so far, with no positives about this reduction in pacing, I'd rather just pass on this version. There's also a magic system. During your journey, you find magical ingredients hidden away without any indicators of items being there. You need to mix three of these ingredients to make magical items that you can attach to your weapon. Once equipped, you can charge your weapon to 100% while holding the R button. After you've filled it up, you can cast a spell with the regular attack button. I get what they were trying to go for here. This is very close to the magic system that Secret of Evermore used. Except you had a dog to sniff out ingredients for you, and Magic used these ingredients up immediately. So you needed to keep stock of these ingredients to keep casting spells. Also, spells in that game did a decent amount of damage to a lot of enemies, where in Ease 5, the few times that I did use Magic, I did no more extra damage than just regular attacks. Considering the game is already very easy as is, I never found a reason to bother exploring Magic. There's too many hassles in the way to bother dealing with something cumbersome in use that doesn't really help you all that much. One thing that confused me though is that in the options menu for the game you can customize what color armor and cloth a doll is wearing. While customization is nice to have, having a small set of preset armor and cloth options feels a bit strange. Why not have your character sprite change to these colors after equipping certain armor? You know, to make the change feel like it's more than just a number going up. Though I guess this was the first step towards actually visualizing armor changes that they would in later games actually use properly. There's also weird visual bugs in the game, like how text boxes in certain areas turn off background layers. Likely because somehow the game is pushing the engine to its limits with the amount of layers used, something that is also supported by the amount of slowdown the game has, but it does seem strange for that to happen since nothing about the game's presentation or mechanics are impressive enough to suggest that the Super Nintendo would struggle to run it. There's still some 
things about Ease 5 that I admire though, and it pains me that I can't really talk about it because I don't want to spoil this game. Let's just say that the moment in most Ease games where you go to the big final dungeon at the end of the game is the part where Lost Kefin really shines. This final dungeon is big enough to have an actual town in it. It isn't too cumbersome or maze-like in structure to explore, and has some really great story setup and execution in it that is almost entirely lacking from the rest of the game. If you do consider checking out the old version of Ease 5 and are patient with the middle of the road SNES action RPG gameplay, it's entirely worth experiencing it just for what it does near the end. The game isn't too long, so it's not that big of a struggle to make it there. If you're not, and you're holding out for the modern remake, I can't say I blame you. Though I am curious what the modern remake will do with the game's setup and story. Fleshing out the early parts would really help the game's flow a lot, and I wouldn't be surprised if they switch events around and have things happen for different reasons, like what they did with Ease 3 between Wanderers and Oath of Algana. What I'm mostly curious about is how they'll make the game fit with the modern overarching plot, as for the most part, the game feels like it's an isolated incident. The overarching plot in Ease games didn't exist until Ease 6, of the next entry that we're going to cover, and has since been retroactively added into the story with the current remakes. For all the missteps that Ease 5 takes, it's still an important game in the series. It's very clear how this game ended up leading the series to the direction that Ease 6 took it into, and while it's far from my favorite game in the series covered so far, at least it's a lot more playable than Mask of the Sun. And like I said previously, I do appreciate how they use the early setup for the game near the end with the ending. Anyway, this was Above Up, I hope you enjoyed the video, and uh, I'm not sure if I would call covering this game having been an entirely fun experience, but I think the ending by itself was worth it. Things are going to get a lot more straightforward from here, as the next two Ease games take place after each other. At least, all the ones except Ease 8, which takes place between Ease 5 and Ease 6. Though having already covered it in the past, I'm not going to go back to that game a second time. As always, this video has been brought to you by people who have supported me on Patreon. If you enjoyed this video and you want to become one of the scrolling people that you see on the screen right now, consider pledging on patreon.com slash above up. And uh, yeah, I'll see you next time with E6. See ya.